I have a doppelganger. <laughs> Dr. Gero is a brilliant but slightly mad scientist in the Dragon Ball Z Android saga. If you look very carefully, you see that his skull has been replaced with a transparent plexiglass dome so that the workings of his brain can be observed and also controlled with light. That's exactly what I do. Optical mind control. <laughs> But in contrast to my evil twin, who lusts after world domination, my motives are not sinister. I control the brain in order to understand how it works. Now, I'm by no means the first person to realize how powerful a tool intervention is. The history of attempts to tinker with the function of the nervous system is long and illustrious. It dates back at least 200 years to Galvani's famous experiments in the late 18th century and beyond. Galvani showed that the frog's legs twitched when he connected the lumbar nerve to a source of electrical current. This experiment revealed the first and perhaps most fundamental nugget of the neural code, that information is written in the form of electrical impulses. Galvani's approach of probing the nervous system with electrodes has remained state-of-the-art until today, despite a number of drawbacks. Sticking wires into the brain is obviously rather crude. It's hard to do in animals that run around, and there is a physical limit to the number of wires that can be inserted simultaneously. So, around the turn of the last century, I started to think, wouldn't it be wonderful if one could take this logic and turn it upside down? So instead of inserting a wire into one spot of the brain, re-engineer the brain itself so that some of its neuronal elements become responsive to a diffusely broadcast signal, such as a flash of light. Such an approach would literally, in a flash of light, overcome many of the obstacles to discovery. First, it's clearly a non-invasive, wireless form of communication. And second, just as in a radio broadcast, you can communicate with many receivers at once. You don't need to know where these receivers are. And uh, it doesn't matter if these receivers move. Just think of the stereo in your car. It gets even better. For it turns out that we can fabricate the receivers out of materials that are encoded in DNA. So each nerve cell with the right genetic makeup will spontaneously produce a receiver that allows us to control its function. I hope you'll appreciate the beautiful simplicity of this concept. There's no high-tech gizmos here, just biology revealed through biology. Now let's take a look at these miraculous receivers up close. As we zoom in on one of these purple neurons, we see that its outer membrane is studded with microscopic pores. Pores like these conduct electrical current and are responsible for all the communication in the nervous system. But these pores here are special. They are coupled to light receptors, similar to the ones in your eyes. Whenever a flash of light hits the receptor, the pore opens and electrical current is switched on, and the neuron fires electrical impulses. Because the light-activated pore is encoded in DNA, we can achieve incredible precision. This is because, although each cell in our bodies contains the same set of genes, different mixes of genes get turned on and off in different cells. We can exploit this to make sure that only some neurons contain our light-activated pore and others don't. So in this cartoon, the bluish-white cell in the upper left corner does not respond to light because it lacks the light-activated pore. The approach works so well that we can write purely artificial messages directly to the brain. In this example, Each electrical impulse, each, each deflection on the trace, is caused by a brief pulse of light. And the approach, of course, also works in moving, behaving animals. This is the first ever such experiment, sort of the optical equivalent of Galvani's. It was done six or seven years ago by my then graduate student, Susanna Lima. Susanna had engineered the fruit fly on the left, 
so that just two out of the 200,000 cells in its brain expressed the light-activated pore. You're familiar with these cells because they are the ones that frustrate you when you try to swap the fly. They trigger the escape reflex that makes the fly jump into the air and fly away whenever you move your hand in position. And you can see here that the flash of light has exactly the same effect. The animal jumps, it spreads its wings, it vibrates them, but it can't actually take off because the fly is sandwiched between two glass plates. Now, to make sure that this was no reaction of the fly to a flash it could see, Susanna did a simple but brutally effective experiment. She cut the heads off of our flies. These headless bodies can live for about a day, but they don't do much. Um, they, just, they, just, they just stand around and, and, and groom excessively. Uh, so it seems that the only trait that survives decapitation is vanity. Um, <laughs> anyway, as, you, as, as you'll see in a moment, Susanna was able to turn on the flight motor of what's the equivalent of the spinal cord of these flies and get some of the headless bodies to actually take off and fly away. They didn't get very far, obviously. Since we took these first steps, the field of optogenetics has exploded, and there's now hundreds of labs using these approaches. And we've come a long way since Galvani's and Susanna's first successes in making animals twitch or jump. We can now actually interfere with their psychology in rather profound ways, 